thank you all very much for joining us um, for this thinking which, as the title suggests, will look back, but must also, I think, given what's happening in the world, um, look very much at the present and, and the future as well. Um, my name's Giles Whittell. I'm an editor here at Tortoise. Most of the very select gathering in the room know that, but um, that's who I am for those joining us online. And the title today makes me, and I think just a very few colleagues feel uh, our age, because 40 years ago, I was, let's just say a teenager, we'll keep it like that, and I have a very specific memory of being allowed to watch the television once every day to hear the updates from the Ministry of Defence spokesman, Ian MacDonald, who, in his poker-faced way, would tell us about casualties, which, because of the school that I went to, was already felt quite close. And then one day, a boy called Jones from my history class left the class. And it was then that we realized that his father was Colonel H. Jones, and he had just been shot um, on the approach to Port Stanley, and his son had gone to grieve his dad. Um, so it was very real, very personal, even to kids at school. It's probably hard to imagine for those who haven't lived through that sort of thing, but I know some people have obviously lived through much, much worse. But since then, of course, the British Armed Forces have um, changed, arguably beyond recognition. Um, spending as a share of GDP has fallen, as the slides showed, by more than half. British armed forces have been tested severely in Iraq and Afghanistan, not always with triumphant results. Um, again, as the slides showed, the British military is still a substantial operation by global standards, up there on the leaderboard, but not at all by British historical standards. Much, much smaller um, as, a, as, a, as a share of national effort, shall we say. I've just invented a new, a new index. Um, than for most of uh, uh, the last few centuries of, of history. The one particular um, uh, data point that I, I noticed today uh, reading up on this, uh, as recently as, as the early 80s, the time of the Falklands War, um, this country fielded 900 bat battle tanks. Uh, we have just a little more than 200 now heading down to 147, a number which um, is half the number less than half the number that has already been destroyed out of the Russian uh, deployment to, to Ukraine. Um, speaking of which, the question of what Britain's armed forces can do now is obviously suddenly very urgent. We've got Putin pushing at the NATO tripwire from the Baltics to the Black Sea. And um, one of our speakers today, one of our speakers who's joining us online, has actually uh, said recently that he believes that it's a matter of when, not if, that NATO, that is NATO, uh, actually has to uh, confront Putin militarily. And, and we'll get to that. Um, the, there are many other things I hope, if we have time, that we can get to, including how uh, the forces have changed as well as, as well as shrunk, whether they've changed in an appropriate way. Um, uh, if not, what are the lessons of Ukraine? What are, what are we doing? wrong, but also possibly what are we doing right. So uh, by way of introduction, um, and we will come to you uh, online, Sir Chris Deverell, uh, with 40 years of service in the army, not only including three as head of Joint Forces Command, but also uh, as a member, I think a fairly successful member of the British Army bobsled team. Bobsled or bobsleigh, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we get that right. Tony Hoare, I hope, will be able to join us, uh, an SAS veteran and author of Born for War. Um, and with us here, Monty Halls, who is both the Monty Halls of uh, marine biology fame and the Monty Halls of uh, Royal Marines fame and author of the forthcoming. Perhaps that aspect of your CV is less known than the marine biology bit because... And anything with the word marine in it right. is, is fine. Like swimming pools, anything. 
<laughs> so the book, the book which we, we've, uh, we've nailed down the exact subtitle, Commando, the inside story of Britain's Royal Marines, is out on the 28th. Um, and it accompanies a BBC series Correct. Of, of the same name. Correct. Um, look, Monty, since you're, you're here with us, um, let, me, let me start with you. Uh, the book, as you was just um, explaining, sort of starts well before the Falklands, but comes bang up to date with the Falklands kind of in the middle. Um, do you think, with that sort of panoramic view of the Marines uh, and their role in the Falklands, that they could now operate as a spear tip of a similarly ambitious British operation? It's a, it's a very good question because it's a simple logistics question. Could we get, it was one of the most ambitious, if not the most ambitious amphibious uh, uh, task force ever launched and amphibious operation ever launched. And uh, could we do it? That's often been a question that's been raised since the Falklands, but would we have to do it? Would we have to go down there? with that amount of people, with thousands of people, with hundreds and hundreds of tons of um, uh, support and logistics attached, or as Ukraine is showing us, could we actually mobilize and deploy with very small groups of extremely effective, well-trained people using advanced technology? And uh, so to, Lenin said that uh, for decades, nothing happens. And then in a few weeks, decades happen. And I think in the last few weeks, decades have happened, and the way wars are conducted are fundamentally altering. And the Marines have had that three times in, in their history, uh, really. And uh, once was when they assumed the commando role, which was 80 years ago, and that was as a response to Dunkirk. But it was, it was really a response to Churchill with all his background in, in South Africa and uh, you know the Boer commandos that held off a force of 250,000 uh, Brits essentially hugely effectively um, just all right we've got to do something you know as the nation despaired and you know it seemed we were entirely vanquished and he came up with this butcher and bolt concept which was the commandos and butcher, uh, and, bolt. butcher and bolt the idea was you'd go in with very small groups of lightly equipped men and take out a target and then go. Right. So the idea was you were never there for more than 24 hours. And that's the reason the Marines, Royal Marines today do all of their commando tests carrying 30 pounds of equipment, because that's all you need for 24 hours, basically. So you've got that, and then you've got the Falklands, which again, was this moment in history when you know, the arc of history changed because the Royal Marines wouldn't exist if the Falklands War hadn't had happened, because in 1981, the Defence Review pretty much got rid of the Royal Marines and then, Galtieri invaded the Falklands. And then you've got now with Ukraine. I think Ukraine is one of those moments. It shows, you know, the effectiveness of small groups of very well-trained people. So every now and then history does a reset, doesn't it, I think? And I wonder if what's happening at the moment is, is a massive reset of the way we go about our business within the armed forces. Well, it's a fascinating notion that Galtieri saved the Marines. Not something he'd go on about, I imagine. Not but, something he would, yeah, no. Yeah. But, um, I mean, from talking to many of them, both serving and mm. veterans for the, for the book, um, what do they want? What, uh, um, do they, are, are they content with the shrink, the overall shrinkage? Uh, does it actually make them a bigger part proportionally of British armed forces? As in the Royal Marines? Yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, I think the Royal Marines have always, always been pretty canny. And, uh, you know, they're kind of 18 months, two years ahead of, uh, in terms of what's happening now, because they um, came up with a concept called Future Commando Force, which is very small groups of uh, highly trained um, men and women operating sort of behind deep into enemy territory or behind enemy lines, using technology to devastating effect, to disrupt what's going on. And the one thing Ukraine has shown us with these long, long logistics chains is just how vulnerable. Um, you know, a large army is to that sort of thing. And, you know, you talked about tanks a moment ago. That 40-mile-long convoy, you know, if it had been up against, uh, you know, really a well-equipped Western force would have ceased to exist. It would have ceased to exist, you know. And so I, I think the, the modern Royal Marines are quite happy with where they are with future commando force and relying very heavily on very well-trained individuals operating uh, with real technology. And commander training has changed in that mm. respect really recently over the last couple of years. And the young lads and lasses going out the gate of the commander training center now are 
you know, sort of super switched on about the technology and all that. And I was mentioning earlier that when drones first came in, they thought, oh, we'll give them to the senior Royal Marines, the older Royal Marines, and they'll be the ones, yeah, because they're really expensive bits of kit. And like 50 crash drones later, they were like, it's the young ones, it's the 18 year olds. They've been training for it all their lives. And we have a cohort of young people coming through who are completely across the technology, completely, this is their world, and they understand it really well. And harnessing that has been shown in Ukraine to devastating effect, actually, just yeah. how good the technology is, and people who have the ability to operate independently using that technology can be devastating. Yeah. But just to be clear, the future commando force is what they are fighting in now, or is it a plan and what they're going to be fighting no, in? No, no, I mean, they are a fully e equipped unit Ready right. to rumble, basically. But the Royal Marines have always uh, sort of divided, they're kind of generalist specialists. So you've also got the, the boarding teams, you know, who operate out in the Gulf, anti smuggling, all that uh, sort of stuff. Um, you've got your traditional commando units who operate, you know, as a, a group of 600 people, you know, heading off and mobilizing as a large number. And you've got future commando force who are these very small groups. And obviously special forces as well, so SBS and SAS, but as you right. special forces now, they all work together. So, uh, yeah, so future commando force is a real thing that's, yeah, operative. Well, look, we'll come back to that, I'm sure, and to that 40 mile long column, which has preoccupied us in previous mm -hmm. thinkings. But I think there's no reason why we shouldn't come back to that, because it's a it, it, it's a fascinating piece of military history that I think will um, keep people uh, picking over the the the, the uh, aging tires of the trucks for a long time. But can we come to Sir Chris Deverell? Uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining us. Um, from Bath, oh, I reckon, I, I, I can't be certain, but that I think I recognize the book bookshelf. Um, well, you're doing well. Um, look, your uh, service in uniform, uh, broadly speaking, covered a lot of the 40-year gap, if I'm not much mistaken, between the Falklands and now. Could you, therefore, do us the service of using that panoramic... Um, viewpoint to tell us in broad terms how the British Armed Forces have changed, um, where the cuts have come, and whether you think they have been appropriate given the changing threats that Britain has faced. It's a long period, so it's a big question, but there you go. Sure. So I think the most obvious um, change you've already mentioned in that um, lead-in, which is the size, you know, um, we are um, less than half the size in the armed forces, regular armed forces today, uh, than we were in 1982. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a, a lot smaller than many, many armed forces around the world. And we, we have fewer, far fewer platforms, i.e. ships, tanks and planes. We just take, for example, the, the Royal Navy. They have about a third the number of ships today that they had in, in 1982. But, and it's a big but, um, almost all militaries have reduced in size over the last 40 years. So that we're, we're, you know, we're not alone in, in doing that because essentially what's happened is that the cost of equipment has escalated and budgets have reduced and, and it, the, the, the um, biggest impact has been on, on manpower. The other thing to say is that of those militaries that are bigger than us um, around the world, and I think you said 33 or 34 in your, in your um, slide presentation, only about five of them um, that are larger than us have militaries that are capable of war fighting at a distance from their own shores. You know, most of those militaries are designed for defense of the, that their own countries, and in a lot of cases also for internal security control. They're not designed to, to, to be expeditionary, as we call it in, in, in the British military, to, to deploy overseas at any distance. So um, I think you can, if, if you just take the numbers, they tell you an uh, incomplete story. Right. The, I mean, there are lots of ways in which we are much better today than we were then. We're better trained, with far more operational experience than, than our counterparts in 1982. Readiness is generally higher than it was. Uh, Sorry, our readiness. platforms. 
readiness, yes, yeah. i.e. the time it takes from being told you must now deploy to actually deploying. We, we, we have a much higher state of readiness generally now than, than it was the case then. It's a much more formalized process. Um, and each platform we have um, is a lot more capable than, than those they replaced. The, the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force has been completely recapitalized in particular, in some cases, several times over since, since the early 1980s. Um, and we have new, new capabilities that we didn't have then, like drones and um, cruise missiles and cyber and, and uh, Earth observation from space, which was in its infancy then, but has now increased exponentially. Um, our joint command and control didn't exist in those days. We, we didn't have a permanent joint headquarters. The, the Falklands operations was, was commanded by the Navy without the benefit of having trained and operated together with the other services, and that had impact. Um, so, you know, there are lots of ways in which, if you just take the number, um, uh, uh, in terms of defense spending or number of people or number of platforms, you conclude that the, the, the armed forces of today is far less capable than the armed forces um, of 1982. But I can tell you for certain, I'd much rather go to war in the armed forces of um, 2022 than the armed forces of 1982. All right, well, that, that's quite an upbeat uh, assessment, and I confess I'm surprised that it's so upbeat. Um, I obviously defer to your greater knowledge, but I'm just trying to square it with the sort of narrative that um, we hear from top brass about the corrosive impact of successive cuts in personnel such that this, this ability to project force, fight a war a long way from your own shores is it may be there in, in, in principle, but we are warned when push comes to shove in practice, it, it may not be there because you haven't got enough reserves and the logistics issues that you mentioned, uh, Monty, uh, suddenly, suddenly come into play. Um, uh, perhaps I, I can see... So I, I, I think I can answer. I mean, so you're absolutely right. Lots of people, especially retired generals and the like, will complain about the fact that the armed forces are smaller, or that the budget is smaller than it was. And I'm not saying that you couldn't argue for more. You, you always can. But what I'm saying is that with the exception of scale, and I want to come back to that, with the exception of scale, we can do everything we could do then, and then some. You know, we are better, more capable. Now, what they could do in those days was deploy, I think you said at the beginning, 25,000 people. Um, for that campaign. Now, now we would really struggle to do that today. So, so the size has diminished, but um, not necessarily the punch. You know, we are um, uh, we have miles more capability in 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 a lot of our units today than we did um, in in, that, in those days. And you know, we see that demonstrated all the time. So recently, the um, Royal Navy sent a uh, carrier strike group to the, to the Far East. You know, one, one of the aircraft carriers, uh, F-35 uh, jets, frigates, destroyers, submarines, auxiliaries, uh, in company with allies. Um, uh, and we deployed that all the way in the end, it got as far as Japan. So to those who say we cannot um, deploy at reach, I, I would challenge that. Okay. Which makes me think of the other uh, narrative, which is that spending has been focused on these big expensive projects, the aircraft carrier, the F-35, uh, at a time when, uh, again, it may be just the, re the retired generals um, uh, say that the most important uh, component in any armed force is, is the people. Um, perhaps before, um, or while you're still there, and I hope you're still there, it's always disconcerting when you, there we go, back to the split screen. Um, uh, you, you could address the elephant in the room, namely the sort of, the, the current threat um, in, in Ukraine. Is that, is, is the lesson of that, that uh, we have taken our eye off conventional threats that we didn't, we couldn't imagine still existed, namely tanks rolling across Central Europe? 
Well, I certainly think that we didn't anticipate uh, large scale conflict in Europe. Uh, and all of the nations uh, in Western Europe, NATO nations and non-NATO nations will be pondering that quite hard because, because it, I think we'd all assumed it was done with. Um, I don't think we had thought that um, large scale armored, sorry, armored warfare was necessarily done with, um, but we didn't think it would really come in Europe. Um, and it obviously has. <laughs> So, so I think we're all going to have to think about the consequences and, and look at what our armed forces should uh, comprise given that threat. But I, but I would like to talk about that threat because I think it is a little bit early to draw conclusions or, or rather, if you, if you were gonna draw conclusions now, you'd say, don't be bloody stupid. You know, if you make stupid assumptions and then configure your force accordingly, you're gonna get a kicking. Right. And that's what Putin did. He, he assumed it was going to be a cakewalk. So they didn't have enough logistics. They didn't have enough uh, transport. They didn't have enough missiles, bombs. They didn't have the right command and control. They sent um, armored columns down a road doing what we call movement, not maneuver. And, and they didn't do a combined arms battle. So they didn't fight infantry and armor together. So you allow the situation to arise where the infantry can sneak up on you um, and shoot snipe at you from a wood line and destroy you whereas if you fight armor and infantry together that's far more difficult to do they didn't they didn't win the air campaign at the outset they didn't establish air superiority i mean th there are so many ways in which they have screwed up however yeah. they are trying to recover from that now they, they have collapsed the number of axes on which they're fighting they appointed a, a single theater commander in the last few days who commands now not just all the, the land forces, but also the air and maritime forces. Um, and they are concentrating and they will use a lot more artillery and air defense, sorry, and, and air attack and cruise missiles than they have been using on a concentrated on a smaller section of the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, and I don't think we can say that the Ukrainians have won yet. You know, there, there are some very, very hard times to come yet. So my view would be about this current conflict. Don't jump too soon to draw conclusions. We need to have the time and the analysis to, to actually um, conclude what happened. Right. But well, I hope we can come back to some of the details of, of, well, even though you say it's too soon to draw conclusions, I'd love to start drawing some. Um, it, but, but first, if we can go to Tony, is, is Tony with us? Tony Hall? Ah, OK, OK, no problem. In that case, um, uh, Chris, let me stay with you on this. And please jump in. Will anybody jump in? I, I, by the way, I missed that out of my introductory spiel. This is a thinking. Raise your hands. Or just shout. I, I have a point. Go on, then. Actually, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Um, the interesting thing, that our focus on our armed forces and, you know, could we do another Falklands? Could we do another, you know, are we still capable of, you know, expeditionary warfare and et cetera, et cetera. The chances of us fighting a large scale conflict in isolation now, just relying on our own forces, are, is, is minimal. I, I, you know, I, I don't know if that's uh, a, a controversial thought, but, uh, you know, we are in these alliances for a reason. And actually, you are looking at where, how you slot in as part of the big picture, uh, essentially. And um, you know, so I think that sort of large scale effort, you, you wouldn't rely on entirely our armed forces in isolation, launching that large scale effort to counter a significant enemy. Um, and that's always worth remembering. You know, that we might not be able to do these huge sort of um, moves, or, although, you know, the, there is capability there without a doubt, but we probably wouldn't need to on our own to right. counter a significant global threat as opposed to a localized flare up. Um, what do you make, though, of, the, of the, the first of those two narratives of complaint, if you like, that I offered to Chris just a, a moment ago? Because in, in my previous life, I'd have to write editorials on and on and on about underfunding of you know, basic military capability, such that veterans came back from Iraq and Afghanistan with no 
decent support network, let alone mm. men for mental health, such that um, service families were accommodated in shoddy barracks, if at all, mm. such that uh, there simply weren't enough of them to, to have proper rotations in and out of combat zones, so that, you know, um, talking to people for your book and, and from your own experience, 10 years, um, is, is, is that a, a narrative of complaint that, that represents the reality for serving British soldiers, or is it fringe? Um, well, uh, the first uh, part of that is the sort of mental health issues, the duty of care, the charter we have as a nation to our service men and women. And you're absolutely right that the, the story now is different to the story 20 years ago. And it was very interesting um, chatting to a lot of the guys uh, that are in the book who had extraordinary experiences in these hugely what we call kinetic environments like Afghanistan, like Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. And then came back with one of the guys we interviewed was involved in a, an extraordinary incident. He's the most highly decorated Royal Marines since World War II. And he um, fought in Fallujah, an incredible action. Um, and he was, he was with the United States Marine Corps, um, extraordinary valor that he, he showed in this um, very, very violent situation. He managed to get all of his guys out and then um, they decided to ship him out. They thought it was the right thing to do because the intensity of what he'd done was to ship him out. And 36 hours later, he was buying ice cream with his kids in a Walmart in America and completely fell apart. Of course, yeah. because, and now that just wouldn't happen, this decompression. There's an interesting argument, by the way, about the whole decompression thing, is that uh, one of the theories about the Falklands, in that uh, one of the theories is that there was maybe slightly less of a mental uh, impact to the Falklands, because the guys had six weeks yeah. getting home That's really to uh, all chat, to process it on the vessels, you know, to have a little... And that decompression period, the importance of that is really acknowledged now. And one of the things I've always said is our armed forces have an absolute legal obligation to go and fight when we as a nation tell them to go and fight. But we have an absolute moral obligation as a nation to look after them for the rest of their lives when they come home, if they have issues. And, um, so, and I think, you know, my feelings are, certain. I can only speak really within the, the remit of the Royal Marines, is that is being very aggressively addressed now. Right. And lots of campaigns and lots of things to have a really good... And they go beyond a mouse mat and a coaster and a nice slogan. We've got a thing called Lift the Lid, where you actually really address the mental health issues. But the fundamental uh, thing of like getting accommodation right and making, treating people like civilised human beings, again, I think that has been addressed. I saw a great thing on Facebook once that British Armed Forces were launching their space campaign sort of thing, and someone had written underneath, how about sorting out hot water in the shower block first? The, you know, that these issues that go to the very heart of the welfare of your people need to be an absolute priority. So mm. it's a very valid point. I, you know, I, I don't know how well I've addressed it. I've, no, you, you know, have. I'm, I'm interested to know whether, to what extent, better UK attention to those issues is, is partly a result of exposure to how they do things in the States. One of the things that Tony Hall says in his book is that after leaving the... Uh, special Forces here, he's worked quite a lot with Special Forces in the US and it was impressed, apart from anything, by the very simple fact that they have a whole federal department, the Veterans Administration, of which we have no equivalent. Um, yes, Emma. Hi. Harley. So and then, and then I, uh, I'd like to come to Andrew Girdwood, if possible, because you made an interesting point about assets, but Emma. So um, I actually served in the Air Force myself, but only for like seven years back in 2000. I have a number of good friends who've actually been serving since that time, who've come out very recently. And my point is sort of to yours, Giles. I think the mindset of the British military is you will just get things done no matter what. And I experienced that you go places, you know, sometimes a small amount of resource compared to the counterparts that are with you. But the attitude of someone in the British military is we figure it out, we get it done, which I think is really valuable and wonderful. But I do think that there is this, yes, you've got all this wonderful capability and you've spent the money on that, but I would argue we haven't looked after necessarily our people enough and maybe spent enough on that. I've seen a number of them who have made that tough decision to leave and they've served for sort of 20 plus years now because they're being deployed more often and they have young kids or you know, they're having to move around and be posted a lot more, or there isn't, there isn't so much sort of flexibility, and I firmly believe that's because 
we've kind of clawed back on our manpower and actually that has put quite a lot of strain on people within who are serving at the moment um, but you don't really see that because the nature of someone in the military is not to complain and is to just get on and get things done so i think i would argue that your point is quite valid it's wonderful having these amazing technology and capabilities and you know yes i think there's a, an argument to shrinking and being a, you know elite and special in that but there's also a point where you are compromising your people and how great your people are and there is there's definitely a retention problem i don't know across other services i wouldn't be able to comment on that but certainly i think to a degree in the RAF from speaking to some of my colleagues where we're actually losing people at that you know with a lot of experience and capability because we're not supporting them in a way that allows them to have a life with their families or the life that they want to have at this stage. And what are you hearing from people you know who are still in the RAF about what, if anything, it's doing to deal with that retention. I'll be honest with you, most of, I don't think, there's, there's very few that I'm closely in touch with now that are in, because actually in the last sort of four or five years, all of my very good friends have made that decision right. to come out. I have one who came out and then she's gone back to do a um, reservist role. Um, she, was, she joined at 17 and was an air woman and is now equivalent to a group captain. So she left, but she's just so wedded to the military that I think it was kind of like she's gone back to. But even that, she took a two-year role. And we talk like, you know, at six months in a year, she was like, I just don't think I can do it. I think I'm going to, I just, yeah, it's not what it was. I, yeah. So um, so there's definitely I, I think a sense. It's a really valid point. It's simple bandwidth, simple mm -hmm. assets, resources. And you still have so many commitments to fulfill and you still need boots on the ground, you still need the, the people in place to actually do it. And you're ab I think it's a very, very valid point that you mess with that at your peril, that, um, that British Armed Forces are committed right the way around the world in training roles and some operational roles. And, and I remember chatting to a, a few Royal Marines when Herrick was, was at its height, Afghanistan was at its height, and them saying to me, it's just a numbers game. It's just a numbers game. You go out once, you get away with it, and then you're deployed again, you might get away with it. And then, and again, we had a, a similar issue, just lack of people, basically. So you're right, there is a critical mass. I wonder if there's a critical point that you hit where suddenly you get this kind of exponential effect that people start leaving in their droves because they never see their families, they're exposed to danger all the time, they're always away, you know, even no matter how well you look after them. It's probably, that's quite an interesting sort of relationship so, yeah, there's, there's one other thing which is i'm not sure if it's so relevant to the other forces probably but a little bit to the air force as well it's obviously over the last 10 15 years the number of bases has shrunk quite considerably mm -hmm. you know we have super bases like brides where everything happens you know line them shut all of the others which meant from a where you can work deployment perspective like not deployed as in overseas mm -hmm. but where you're posted sorry has become much narrower so there's less flexibility about where you live so whereas before you might have I know based yourself somewhere in the southwest and your family's there and there were a number of places you could be posted that were close enough to home now suddenly there isn't that availability so actually are you going to be posted to the north of england when you mm. know your other half and your your family mm. is down in the southwest so i think that might you know has affected to a degree that way you look after your people becomes more complicated i suppose mm. in that sense yeah, yeah, yeah. but the very fact that we're talking in those terms um, suggests that that can do, uh, give, we, we'll, we'll do what we're told to do, we'll find it, we'll figure it out, what did you say, we'll figure it out and get it done attitude yeah. that, that prevailed when you joined the RAF is itself changing, that, that, that there's more consideration for families. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think you're right, I think there's still, yeah, I think there's people who have got pushed to maybe it's not critical mass or it, maybe it's like a critical point mm. where it's like actually it can't offer me quite the flexibility it did and you know i think those i think those priorities were still there in terms of people who have families obviously it's different because i was a lot younger when i was yeah. at that stage so for me it was you know kind of wherever they send me mm. and they take me and all of that kind of stuff um but i think back then like i said i think because there was a bit more flexibility in the system it probably didn't come to a head quite so much whereas now it is coming to a head because there is less flexibility in that overall structure of where you can be. There's, so There's an interesting dynamic as well, and we, we, we were chatting about this earlier, that um, one of the things, um, as an experienced logisticians watched what was happening in Ukraine, they couldn't believe what was happening. 
you know, the column, it, all that sort of getting bogged down, no fuel. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. And interestingly, your experience when you're in your early 30s, mid 30s, you know, 40, that's when you're really experienced. That's also when you've got kids, you've got family, you've got one. It's an unbelievable life in your 20s, you know. It's a, a rugby tour with guns, you know. That was kind of almost like my Marines career. And, um, uh, but then other things kick in and that group of people is so important you look after them. That's where all your experience is, that's where all your, you know, that's, that's where your expertise lies, your wisdom, your elders, they're all in there. And you lose them at your peril. And you might be slicing elsewhere and, and losing resources elsewhere, but it's actually impacting them because they're being deployed more often, they're being away from their kids and they're voting with their feet. So it's that, it's that hidden aspect of defense cuts, actually. Yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting point, that. Okay, so we've got quite a few people. Uh, I, uh, Chris, I note that your hand's up. Uh, Matt, James, yeah, okay. And, and, but I, I, we're gonna do it in this order. We're gonna come to Andrew, if possible, if you're there, because I, wanna, I want to see if, if you want to expand on your point about your anxiety about whether we're putting our eggs in the right basket. Then we'll come to Chris, then we'll come to Matt, and then we'll hoover up this part of the room. Um, Andrew. Oh, yes, I'll try and expand. That was really a, a point. So I was listening to Chris explain that although we don't have the, the, the scope that we've got power, better ships rather than more ships and that sort of thing. And I thought, well, we've got, you know, Russia's firing these hypersonic missiles that we can't seem to shoot down. Well, who knows what we're actually capable of. But the idea of, you know, eggs and baskets when you can't defend your basket seems like a potentially a strategic error. Um, but I don't think it's just ships where we have eggs and masks. It's, it's, it's even, you know, if it's like um, cyber warfare teams, there is, a, there, is a, there is an argument to, to volume, just to, to, to cover all the bases, cover all the new fronts in, in, in the world that we're now in, which, which we thought was just going to be um, cyber, but it now looks like it's going to be cyber robotic and traditional, you know, Russian um, military shaping over Europe. So I, I wonder if there's an argument to say that we, we, need, we need lots of baskets, we need lots of eggs. Okay, Andrew, just before we come to Chris then, is it your view that the only way to uh, cover all the bases or baskets or whatever the metaphor is, is to spend more money? I don't know. I, I, that's very I, I find that I quite like the New Zealand approach as well, which is we're New Zealand. Why do we need an air force? <laughs> it seems to be like a sensible use of money. Um, but who knows? The Russians have just thrown a complete clangor at everybody, haven't they? Yeah, certainly have. Thank you. Well, uh, Chris, let's come back to you. you. You raised your hand. What did you want to say? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. So the issue isn't size per se, it's the assumptions about what you do uh, and then how well they map to the size. And, and you know, the comments made by Monty and others in the audience about the, the scale of commitments um, being unsustainable and therefore they're having an impact on people is very true. But it stemmed from us doing more than we were designed to do. We had, we had more troops deployed than were uh, in our defense planning assumptions. That meant people had to go more frequently uh, on those deployments than uh, was intended. And so the, the real issue is what do we want to be able to do over time and in individual campaigns? Uh, it's not size per se. And I would, I would argue that the biggest deficiency over the decade Decades in the case has been this mismatch between our assumptions uh, and what we actually did. So, so I, I would pay a lot of attention to going forward to, to that. What, what, what do we expect of our armed forces in terms of volume deployed at any particular moment in time or over time and, and right size to that? And that, I mean, the evidence is we will always uh, do more than uh, our assumptions, but at times in the past few decades, these two things have been violently out of kilter. Okay, so just to expand on that mismatch between assumptions and what we did, you're saying the, the mismatch was in terms of 
scale or the nature of the activity? Um, it was mostly in terms of scale. Um, so to, to, to sort of use some technical jargon, which you don't actually need to understand, because I think it just makes the point. Throughout the period of Iraq and Afghanistan, the, the British Army was right, was sized in theory for one medium scale deployment, essentially a brigade, and one small scale deployment ongoing. So it's essentially a battle group, a unit. But in, in actual fact, we were doing two mediums, in, or, or in fact, more than medium scale deployments, two more bigger than brigade scale deployments. And that mismatch was really painful. And that, ha that had all kinds of effects on our people. Now, I'm not saying there aren't things that we could have done about housing or should be doing about housing still, but, but the biggest impact, I think, on people uh, is a mismatch between assumption and commitment. Okay, thanks. Uh, Matt. Um, hi, yes, I'm Matt Dankenner. I'm one of the editors here. Um, uh, Monty, congratulations on your book and really, really, really looking forward to reading it and, and indeed the series. Um, Giles and I were talking before, actually, about some of the things that we've been addressing and in particular there was a fascinating exchange between the Prime Minister and Tobias Elwood, the Chair of the Defence Select Committee, I think in November at the Liaison Committee, where um, Elwood was kind of, you know, quite animated about the decline in, relative decline in defence spending and, and in numbers and so forth and the capacities he saw it um, for the UK to contribute to um, coalition forces, expeditionary or otherwise. And the Prime Minister r rather mocked him and said essentially that the era of conventional warfare in Europe was over, certainly in Europe was over, and uh, he talked about cyber. And um, I mainly write about politics, and I have to say that in my experience over the last 10 or 15 years, politicians have been kind of bewitched and mesmerized by cyber mm. and bored by talking about conventional mm. um, weaponry. Um, which, uh, and which brings me around to what you, you, you were saying in your introductory remarks, fascinating that you, you thought Ukraine was for the commandos, but also you know, for the Marines, but also presumably for other parts of the armed services, a kind of punctuation mark. And so I'm very interested in what you, you mean by that, because as you say, we're, we're seeing some extraordinary um, tech-led achievements. Um, and th there's no doubt that when the history of this war is written, tech will play a huge part in that. But also, um, already, you know, the certain strategic assumptions that were being made about the future having to be at least uh, amended and in some cases torn up and rewritten completely. Mm. I mean, one thing I assume is that is going to happen as a consequence of this conflict, however long it lasts, is that the NATO commitment in Eastern Europe and the Baltics and so on is going to upscale quite considerably. So even, you know, your point about we wouldn't do an expeditionary force like the Falklands notwithstanding, I assume that British forces will be involved in 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 greater numbers, even if other NATO members step up to the plate a bit more than they have previously. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that hybrid dimension to the new... I mean, your, your punctuation mark is, point is so striking. And so what, what, what character does that hybrid warfare have? I, I, I'm sort of basing it really on, um, obviously, you know, observing the media, as, as we all do now, sort of mesmerised by this, you know potentially apocalyptic horror show we're seeing and just think how is this manifesting itself how is this playing out and but also seeing it as a military guy of, of a certain vintage and um realizing the sheer value there's an old military adage it says boots on the ground you cannot beat boots on the ground technology is amazing cyber warfare incredible you know remote systems amazing but you can never beat boots on the ground as in having a physical presence on the ground. And I think that physical presence on the ground, of, as I, I keep coming back to these small groups of very well-trained people, um, using, there was a great quote from a US Marine who's fighting out in Ukraine at the moment. And he said, um, when he fought in Iraq, they were always really jealous of the guys in the tanks because they were invulnerable. And now they feel really sorry for the guys in the tanks because they're the ones who are all being taken out with shoulder-launched 
man-portable weapons that require relatively short training period to get your head around it. You know, that, things like that fundamentally alter warfare. And um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I think in answer to the question, there are certain, um, the military evolves constantly and warfare evolves constantly, but there are some constants within it. And one of them, I think, is look after your people, make sure you look after your people. And the other one is you simply can't be a physical presence on the ground. Doesn't matter how good your cyber is, doesn't matter how good anything else is, to physically have people on the ground holding a space. I, I don't think will ever change, in my opinion. I don't think it will ever change. And I think that is manifesting itself in, in Ukraine. But do you moment. agree with Chris's point that it's too soon to say in sort of tactical terms what the lessons of Ukraine are? Because mm. I'm really struck, coming back as I mm. reflexively do, to that 40-mile column of doom. Mm. Um, we learn now that, um, yeah, there were drones. There were also Ukrainian uh, infantrymen on quad bikes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, should yeah. we be re-equipping with quad bikes? Yeah. Or, or should we be arming up with... Toyota Hiluxes with guns in the back which can go anywhere rather than get stuck in the mud. Yeah, oh, well one of the things that's very obviously emerged over the last 45 minutes is Chris knows a heck of a lot more about this stuff than I do. But, um, yeah, you know, as I said that, um, the ability to, to operate independently, the ability to, to survive within a landscape, melt into that landscape. These are all traditional old commando skills, by the way. This is what the commandos did, you know. The ability to have um, very sophisticated small groups who can do anything, basically, is manifesting itself in, in the way this is shaping out. And I also, I, you know, I think it was a very important and interesting point that Chris made. I've fallen into that trap of thinking, oh, well, it's done. They've taken an absolute shoeing. You know, there's no way they're going to take NATO on. No way. You know, in almost every um, area of conventional forces, NATO is considerably larger and better equipped and better trained than, than Russia, um, except for the nuclear side, actually. That's the only side where they're larger than us. But um, uh, I think it's a very interesting point to think that actually what's going on now is regrouping, re-education, rearming, and going again in a much more focused way. And that's a really frightening prospects, I think. So. Okay. Mm. Well, um, we're getting slightly short on time. I do want to come to the hands that were up, if they're still up, in principle, in this part of the room. But first, I just want to use that reference to the importance of operating independently as an inelegant, inelegant segue uh, to if Mr. or Ms. S.D. Holden is still out there. You made an interesting point, uh, if you're there, about the need for Britain's flagship to be able to operate independently. And I wanted to come back on that if you are there, because Chris made an interesting point, and so did you, Monty, about the need to, to interoperability, I think it's called. And I'm going to check my chat because someone's going to tell me if, uh, if. Yeah, hello there. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. So it was the point you made about um, the, was it HMS? Queen Elizabeth, what's the name of the ca carrier? Oh, yeah, Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, going to uh, the Far East as part of a, a, a fleet with lots of other services, including from other countries. And, and I was just intrigued by the point you, you made about um, the need for a flagship to be able to operate independently as well. Yeah, well, I, I fully accept Chris's point earlier that uh, we're unlikely to go into a serious conflict without allies on our side. But we do want to project not just diplomacy, but we, we do want to project power around the world. That is a stated requirement on our government. And I think, uh, I think we need to be able to do that and have assets there that can actually protect us while we're doing so, particularly in light of the emergent threat from obviously the Far East, China in particular. And what does that require that, that British armed forces don't have already? Um, additional destroyers and frigates to provide the underwater risks um, to monitor them and to protect against them. And likewise in the air, we have a number of aircraft on Queen Elizabeth, but uh, I understand that the Americans probably have the majority of aircraft on there in terms of fixed wing capacity. Is it your impression that you, the war in Ukraine might lead to the kind of sea change in government thinking that would 
induce, perhaps not our current chancellor, who may not be with us very much longer, but induce a chancellor to loosen the purse strings to pay for more destroyers and frigates? Um, right now, I think that's going to be a very difficult ask of any chancellor. Um, but I think, uh, realistically, if we're going to support that asset and achieve the objective of having that sort of projection capability, it's the biggest, uh, biggest aircraft carrier we have ever had. Um, and therefore, we've made a massive in investment in it. It seems to me only right and proper that you should protect that huge investment. Now, my electronic crib sheet here tells me that you are a Navy veteran. Is that right? Um, I did 20 years, but that is some time ago now. I was, uh, I've been out 20 years as well. OK, so we'll take it as um, disinterested advice for, for the armed forces. Um, uh, who was, uh, had their hand up first? Yes. Xavier, a colleague of mine, and then we'll come to James if you still want to, and then Jasper. But we'll have to be quick. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really quick. Sorry, this is uh, probably more of a question, but I'm going to phrase it rhetorically. Um, obviously, you know, we can see with the Russians that however, you know, much military capability you have, if you get a strategy wrong and if you get the intelligence wrong, you suffer. So I wonder when we're talking about whether the, you know, armed forces have kind of improved or gotten worse in terms of their capability, whether our military intelligence has got much better over the past 40 years, whether our uh, ability to kind of read a situation to time intervention, all of these things which are obviously really important in this current war, whether uh, we can see that that's improved or got worse over time. Well, it's a great question and a perfect one for Chris. Chris, did you hear that? Because I yeah, believe I did. intelligence was one of your responsibilities at Joint Force Command, is that right? It was, yeah. Defence intelligence worked for me, yeah. So um, I think uh, we, our technical capabilities got a lot better uh, over, over the years. We have better um, eavesdropping capability, um, electronic uh, listening capability, and we can see much more from space than used to be the case. And indeed, you've seen some of that in this campaign. You've seen commercial satellites produce images that will show a body on a road um, in, a, in a town that the Russians have, have destroyed. So, so the quality of information available to our um, intelligence organizations is a lot um, greater than it was. It doesn't automatically make them better analysts. Um, and we have got some things wildly wrong in the last few decades. For example, we were convinced there would be weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and there weren't. So I don't think you can you, you can rest easy on your laurels. Yes, I think we did well to say from about December onwards that Putin was going to invade Ukraine. That was clear and British intelligence and um, the US um, intelligence was saying that. But could we could we say two years ago that that was going to happen? You know, I, I'm not so sure we could have done. Um, and usually a, a lot of these things have come up and surprised us at the last minute. So I don't think you can be too relaxed about our capability. Our technical capabilities got better, but it doesn't necessarily produce better analysis. While we're on this, I can't resist asking, what is your understanding of this intelligence which has been lauded and the way it has been foregrounded, if you excuse the jargon? Uh, is that mainly eavesdropping and um, satellites, or is it human intelligence as well? No, there's every kind of intelligence in, uh, going to um, produce that um, stuff. But what's made it much more releasable is open source information. Right. You know, and and now through through commercial satellites and other open source to data tools, you can tell so much more than you could before. Indeed, I've always believed, well, I had believed for the last few years that the paradigm is shifting. We used to have these very very high tech, very very expensive. Um, technical means, to, which were the basis of our, our intelligence, which were secret, classified um, sources. And then we used to have our own um, unclassified sources on top of that, which we added to, to give it a bit of color or flavor. The, the paradigm is, is, is overturning. Now, the basic intelligence um, capability is all open source, unclassified. And then you put, you put the classified um, information on top of that uh, and that's a much better way round to be doing it 
Okay, so technically we're out of time because of the, the flags up, but um, I promised you, James and Jasper, imagine you were in a lift and you've got between the ground floor and the tenth floor. Shoot. I'm interested in how um, the lack of people kind of point and how the army have been deployed um, quite significantly in recent years to cover for G4S for the Olympics. They've been brought in to deal with the floods. They've been brought in to deal with the fuel crisis and drive lorries. And how will the projected cut in troops, I think it's 72,000 by 2025, square with that increase, increasing likelihood of natural disasters and, and floods and unusual weather patterns due to climate change and would probably have to honor our obligations by deploying uh, NATO, our troops in NATO countries in Europe. Will we have enough people to deal with these domestic emergencies that, that rise? It's a great question. I'll, I'll ask Chris and Monty to respond briefly to that at the end. Um, yeah. Jasper. Oh, sorry. Uh, just briefly, uh, isn't one of the biggest threats to the British Armed Forces now the MOD? Because if you look at the Public Accounts Committee report that came out, I think, at the tail end of last year, it described how billions of taxpayers' money was being wasted, uh, that the MOD couldn't account for where that money was going. In fact, I think they said the whole procurement system was actually broken. Uh, and so isn't, I mean, isn't that the, one of the biggest problems? Another good point. OK, hold those two thoughts. And uh, just uh, I'm going to quote from Tony, because Tony couldn't be with us in the end. But uh, his book is uh, also a great read. And um, to honor this, his spirit, um, I'm just going to quote from him and then ask you, uh, Chris and Monty, to respond to what he says and to these two points, uh, very briefly to wrap up. I am not opposed to war, he writes. But I do feel that the armed forces have been used and abused in recent decades and that the military covenant has not been honoured. I mean, we get a sense from what you've already said during the past hour of what your response to that is. But, um, Chris, if, if we could start with you, has the military covenant been honoured? And um, to James's point, has this, uh, is, is there mission creep in the use of armed forces that might be eroding that? And uh, is, is, yeah. um, is the Min Ministry of Defence also uh, one of the armed forces' worst enemies? I'm, I'm not going to take on the procurement um, point because, to be honest, it, that is a subject for a programme in itself, and, and I don't think you can answer it quickly. On the people issue, I don't think the covenant has been honoured in full. You know, I think that we could all point to ways in which it, um, it's been less than satisfactory. And I do think, uh, personally, that 72,500 is too small for the level of commitments that are likely to be placed on the on the army. But um, the you know there are two ways out of that problem: increase the size of the army or reduce the number of commitments. And and you know if the government would do that and do that honestly, you could achieve the same effect by reducing the number of commitments. But but um, you know the, the odds of that are not high. 72,500, by the way, isn't a really big reduction in real terms because the army is already much smaller than it's supposed to be. Um, but nevertheless, you know, so I don't think it is big enough for the commitments that it's likely to be given. Thank you, Chris. Monty, your final word on all this. I'm, as ever, I'm going to reduce it to a fairly sort of simple level and personal experiential level. And I think in terms of the covenants of the armed forces, a great example is America. You know, the way they, they treat their veterans, the way they look after their veterans is, is you know, a real kind of example. And um, yeah, you know, I do, I, I think we're getting better at it. You know, my, my personal experience in researching the book and writing the book appears that we're getting better at it, but we've still got a way uh, to go. And there's a great expression in the armed forces that says improvise, adapt and overcome. And when you're given a job to do or given 50 jobs to do, you get them done, basically. And um, that runs right through the DNA of the armed forces. So in, in, in terms of like the civil work, et cetera, et cetera, you know, what I can say is every single unit, every single person, every single troop, everything will strain every sinew to honor every obligation that's put upon them. But there's only so much that any organization can handle and any individual can handle. And when you start getting attrition within that organization, then you've got a problem. Ministry of Defense, it's been interesting doing the book and the TV series. I've had to work with the Ministry of Defense and the BBC, two of the less nimble administrative <laughs> organizations. 
and it's been an education. <laughs> it's really been an education. And, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, it's been an education, <laughs> uh, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there are some interesting things going on there, I'd say, some interesting issues that, that do need looking at, I think. Well, Jasper, I think that answers your question in the affirmative. Um, thank you. Uh, Monty and Chris very much for joining us. The question at the top was 40 years after the Falklands, what can the British Armed Forces still do? Well, what I've learned uh, from Chris right at the start was a great deal, in, in, including a great deal that the British Armed Forces simply couldn't do uh, 40 years ago, which runs counter to the, the narrative that, as you can tell, I'd been fed of um, degradation throughout. Um, but but I, think, I think there's quite a lot of consensus on, on Emma's point that um, the assumption that British um, armed forces members will find a way to get it done at whatever cost uh, is, is being taken for granted. Um, uh, to the absent uh, Tony's point, the, the covenant is being stretched if not broken, that a great deal is being asked of fewer and fewer people, that 72,000, 72,500 is not enough, uh, especially given our habits of increasing the commitments to Chris's point uh, that we um, expect of the armed forces. Anyway, um, thank you all very much. Let's hope that we don't have to go and fight another expeditionary war without allies uh, at any point in the next 40 years. And, um, and, and perhaps even that the Falklands uh, dispute resolves itself diplomatically so that uh, those down there can eat good Argentinian steak and drink great red wine uh, on, a, on a mutually agreed basis um, uh, rather than going to war again. But thank you all very much, Monty, Chris especially, and everyone in the room. Join us next time.